Okay, so folks, uh, my name is Louise, and um, before we get into the agenda and the introductions, I just thought I had a visual slide here of why we're here. We all know that we have a few issues with the coast, right? So um, let's start out with that visual to get going. Um, so we are the Coastal Advisory Commission for the Town of Situate. I'm going to introduce us in a moment. And basically what we want to do is communicate the various programs and grants and projects that the town is doing and set up a better communication path between you, the residents, and the town and represent your ideas to them and back and forth that way because we think that's a little bit of a gap um, in the town. So our focus is really to hear from you and we're saving at least half an hour at the end for that. And on that end, um, we aren't taking any questions till the end because otherwise we'd be here all night. Um, what we will find out is that there's probably going to be some topics that you're going to say, well, I really want to know more about that. Then perfect, we can plan on the forums for that. But I want you to know that today is really an overview. Um, and we're not going into a deep dive, but we think it's really important that everyone sort of learns what the town has been doing for the last five plus years how they're spending money, where they're getting the money from, etc. So to start out, um, I want to introduce Kyle Boyd, who is the Coastal Management Officer. You probably know him, Kevin Cafferty right here. Um, let's see, we've got Chief right here, Murphy, Fire, Frank Snow right there, John Grant right there, Wade, and Linda is at the um, reception desk back there. Um, Tom Hall is also back there, and Paula is on vacation. Um, we also have Brad Washburn, Director of Planning and Development. Most of you know him. Are there any other officials from the town, or um, would you introduce yourself to the crowd? Sure. Uh, Tony Vignani, Board of Selectmen. Great. So glad that you're here. Any uh, local representatives or anybody else that we should know about to address? Um, thank you for coming. Um, so anyway, this is this is who we are. Um, I want to say a very special thank you to Carolyn Rutowski, Wave. Um, she volunteered to do the presentation. This is a grassroots effort, no budget, no nothing. And so I was looking for someone to do it for us for free. And so I contacted her. She's the department chair of South Shore Boat Tech in graphic design and visual communication. And she couldn't, you know, the student thing didn't work. She said, well, I'm a resident of Situate, so I'll do it. So thank you so much, Carolyn. I really appreciate it. <laughs> so um, before we get into the overview of the projects, we feel it's quite important to just sort of be grounded in the basics of what are we dealing with in those pictures that you see? What are we dealing with in the sea level rise? So I want to introduce John Grant, who's on our committee, who's an oceanographer and also a coastal engineer. Uh, hi. So sea level rise tends to get discussed as part of climate change a lot. Oh, sorry. Well, you have an agenda in your hand, so we can go right into this. So. Um, we can just do this. So um, the, the thought was. How do we decouple sea level rise a little bit from climate change? So the minute climate change and sea level rise start getting discussed together, it becomes a hot button topic. And as a result, sea level rise doesn't always get discussed uh, sort of in the best way when communities are talking about shorelines, shoreline protection, and, and how our shorelines are changing and, and the issues that we face. So what do we know about sea level rise? Um, at no point in the Earth's history has sea level ever been constant. So. Over the last 18,000 years, it's risen about 100 meters. Globally, um, our local sea level has risen about 11 inches in the last 100 year. That's uh, direct measurements from Boston. Um, the major factors that are affecting sea level include glacial ice melt, which we have direct measurements of. Uh, if you pick up any newspaper, if you look online, there's satellite photos that show the changing ice sheets, if you look at the before and after pictures of cold climate shorelines, you can see how glaciers have changed. So we know that there's a, an influx of that, thermal expansion of ocean waters as they warm. Again, we have direct measurements of, of how the sea surface has changed. Uh, we also know it's a fishing community here. It's, we know how species have migrated, how they've changed, what we see by way of, of sharks, of fish, of other things, that, that that's warming. 
um, and land subsidence. That's not a huge chunk. That's uh, not a lot different than sort of what you see in your backyard by way of, of land impacting. Um, so what does it mean in the future? So this is where sea level gets back into climate change. Um, it's, these are sort of forecast graphs that I'm sure you've all seen from many different things about what the forecast of the future will look like. And to some degree, it's less important right now, today anyways, whether it's situated it up here, here, or up there, what is important is the fact that we can all agree on the fact that sea level has been rising, it is rising, it's going to continue rising at an increased rate, and that affects us as a community. So how does it affect our shoreline? So this is a very simplistic sort of, of look at it, but every shoreline um, is unique. It has a unique set of characteristics that make it up, whether it's, it's bedrock shoreline, whether it's rocks, whether it's cobbles, whether it's sediment, what type of sediment, what type of drainage, upland features, and there's a unique energy profile that faces that shoreline. So it's the winds, it's the waves, it's storms, it's bathymetric features, it's offshore features, it's the orientation of the shoreline and those energy profiles. And nature is going to give that shoreline a distinct shape um, and always try and return to that shape based on that energy seeing that, that part of, of the shoreline. So how sea level rise affects that is if the blue is sort of our our natural shoreline shape at a certain area, as sea level rises right here, nature is going to try and move that profile back to what it was. And again, very simplistically, the way it's going to do that is erode all this material, deposit it here, and essentially shift this profile up and inland. So that you now have that same profile returned back here. And the way it's going to do that by taking this sediment and moving it out here is you end up with this shift gives you a, a corresponding retreat inland. So the important part of this is that because of the amount of material that needs to be removed, that sea level rise is often the retreat, the corresponding retreat is often 50 to 100 times what the sea level rise. So it's not uncommon you're going to get from one inch of sea level rise, you can get 50 to 100 inches of essentially shoreline retreat coming back in. So how does that then affect uh, with shoreline protection? So we have a number of seawalls. Uh, we have a number of other shoreline protections. The, the, the problem with shoreline protection as far as nature sees it is we see a concrete wall, nature doesn't see that sort of that barrier. So again, nature is going to try and return to what it had. So as sea level rises, nature is going to try and recreate that profile. The problem is now, it can't erode this material. It doesn't, it's not able to get at it. So what's going to happen is you end up with erosion here, which gives you a smaller deposit here. And this profile, instead of shifting slightly in, shifts further in, and the resulting issue from that, or the complexity, is that the depth at which your waves break is now moved here. Mm -hmm. So the resulting problem from it is that you have breaking waves now much closer to the seawall or the shoreline protection, you have additional erosion at the base, and you have sort of an overtopping of waves getting behind the seawall and over the top of the seawall. So it just adds complexity. So it's not good, it's not bad, it's just how the system responds. So we just wanted to touch on it real quick so that everybody understands that it's, as sea level rises, it is rising. It just adds complexity to our conversation and how we discuss things. But it's a lot easier to discuss how we address these things if we sort of all start on the same footing as far as how our system is changing and why. Thanks, John. Thank you. Uh, I did want to go back to the agenda for a second. You do have it in your handouts, but just to give you a better sense of what we're doing tonight, um, we just talked about the sea level rise. We do want to look at what the town has been doing for the last few years. We do understand people are a little antsy about all the studies that have been done. We're going to explain why the studies are important. 
Um, we're going to talk about money, money coming from the town, money coming from FEMA, money coming from grants, um, which I think is of great interest to people. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the current projects and the ones in the last couple of years, but then we'll get to some exciting new projects that are just um, breaking right now. And one of our main goals is to include you folks in this whole feedback loop, so we will leave at least a half an hour for a Q&A and then go over um, on the whiteboard uh, what your ideas are for other priorities. So, this is what we've heard for over a year. When I, I was just, I'm just a regular citizen, I'm no one's special, I go to these meetings and everyone says, oh, you know, what is it with all these studies that the town has commissioned? Why do we have all these studies? And um, in fact, when we tried to congregate the Situate Harbor Business Association, we had a lot of resistance, and that was the resistance. All these studies, nothing ever happens. If we do anything well tonight, I hope you'll see that a lot of stuff has happened, and the town has been extremely active um, in using those studies. Um, essentially, what happens is we have all kinds of reports that we have to file. We have studies. We had a large community assessment that some of you participated in last year where you were interviewed. Um, and filing reports for hazard mitigation, all of those studies or reports or whatever you want to classify them lead to helping the town set the right priorities and fill out grant proposals. If we don't have any science or any background that's documented, it's very hard to fill out grant applications. So what we're showing here is that that stuff is necessary. It leads to budgeted projects, it leads to permitting, and it leads to real work. So hopefully that's clear and in the Q&A, please feel free to come back to me if that wasn't clear. Um, real work and real dollars. The town of Situate over the last 10 years has committed to 22.8 million in terms of foreshore protection, which is a pretty significant number. And the way that we're choosing to break it out shows that half of it's from the town and the taxpayers, but half of it's from people in the town working hard to get grants um, and FEMA repair designs. We put that money in the top part because it really is being worked on for designing repairs. But most of that money is from grants. So you would say 50-50 comes from us, the taxpayers, but the rest of it is coming from all of those organizations that people like Kyle and Brad and Kevin and others are really working hard to make sure that we get funding for. We also, on top of that, have FEMA obligated claims. And later on, when you're mingling around, there's a couple of charts about FEMA claims over there that um, John will be talking about in a minute as well. And what happens is we have, actually, we have 18 million in obligated claims, and he'll speak to that, 14 plus the four above. And uh, we received 75% reimbursement of that dollar. So John's going to take, get, tell you a little bit more about FEMA. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So I'm going to talk a little bit about FEMA. And as the slide says, uh, the next slide, please. That one? Uh, you want to go back? Just talk about FEMA. All right. It may not be here. It's not important, but. Basically, Situate is number one in the country in claims, just on private homes. Never mind the 18 million we're talking about with the public claims. So we've been hit hard. Everybody here knows that. I think everybody here is from, from the coastline. We don't even include 2010. We had the seawall breach. I think in Situate alone, we almost met the threshold for the state, but we did not. We had about five to six million dollars that we had to recover and, and, and to repair. So looking back at uh, since 2012. We've had four storms that have been claimed, Sandy 2012, Nemo in 2013, Juno in 2015, and then the 18th storm, which is Riley Bass in 2018, March 2nd. Oh, well. So all those storms cumulative right now, we have about $18 million in damage. And that's not even really including some possible mitigation that we can go at. So the $18 million, so just, I'm gonna take the example for the March storm. March 2nd, we had the storm, it lasted about six days. And uh, I know in some areas in Hum Rock, it took about five days to clear one path. We had about 14 feet of debris, so it was, it was a daunting task just getting the town back in some sense of normalcy. In June, the president declared this is a, um, is a national disaster and they, they obligated funding. And finally in September, FEMA came to town and we started working on the documentation. 
documentation, documentation, documentation. We've been working on that. We finally completed our non-coastal stuff. We're still getting emails to finalize, but the documentation, I mean, dozens of hours every month. I mean, it, on top of our other jobs. So the documentation, and it's black and white with FEMA. You know, if you don't meet that criteria, we need more information. We've gone to some point through human so much information, information, they say, oh, sorry, that doesn't qualify. Because they have so much going on countrywide, they have a lot of people that sort of bring into it. And that, and that happened this year, but he learned a lot, and we're getting it done. So it's a lot of work to get to this point, to where we now try to get these projects obligated. What obligated means is when you give them all the information, they approve it, and now it's obligated. Basically, the feds send the money to the state, and NEMA holds on to that money. So we have uh, most of the storms in the past. We're still waiting for Riley, which is about seven or eight million dollars out of that 22. But most of that money's been obligated. There's one project that's over five million dollars. They call it an RFS. They won't release that five million dollars, but it's been obligated because it's such a, a, a large amount of money. It's a third cliff project. They're going to hold on to that until we start doing work. We don't get the reimbursement until we complete the project. So that's what creative financing, what we're going to try to do is try to do it in phases. So maybe do 20 percent. All right, give us back some money. Put it in the kitty. Got to the next phase. So we, um, with the Sandy, Nemo, Juno, and, and Riley, we have four locations that have probably 80 percent of the damage. It's mostly coastal revetment, uh, a lot of the foreshore protection there. And for the first time that I'm aware of, FEMA has allowed us to combine those projects. Otherwise, to try to manage that and say, this is from this storm, this is from this storm, that's from that storm. That's what it was until we got that, basically, agreement signed um, or, or, or obligated from them to do this spring. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to get out. We have a deadline of December, 30, December 31st, 2021, to complete this project, all these projects. So it's been a challenge because every time you start it and the BBW engineers, it gets ready to go out, we get another storm and get more damage. So that's the FEMA process. It's daunting. Hopefully we don't get any, you know, major storms that can impede our progress. But right now, FEMA's working with us to get those four big locations moved forward and try to get these projects out and get them done and get it completed and, and, and make our town more resilient. If you want to go to the next claim, we'll give you an idea just as far as the, um, all the money told up and, the, and it's going to cost a total of $18 million and FEMA will pay 75%. There's still some other options as far as mitigation that we may further look into, but we're still up low, obligated by 25%. So you come over here, if you look at these charts over here, this chart will show you, these are the four storms, and it shows these four combined project locations that we're trying to get uh, FEMA, which they did allow us to move forward. And that's the only way we can move forward. So uh, that's the process. It's mainly the DPW engineers, finance, Right now, emergency manager is myself and the deputy chief. There's a handful of people that have been getting information from every department. And every department's worked hard. They've all worked hard to come up with documentation. Because they need, when you go out and say, all right, somebody was working on a truck. What size truck? What size engine? Uh, four wheel drive. Um, where did it go? Who was driving it? What's their rate? What are the benefits? It's, it's a lot of work. So <coughs> understanding the town, all the employees in town are working hard to get us information to this so we can put it together, format it to the way FEMA wants it, and submit it. So that's what we are now. All the non-coastal stuff's in. We have hired a consultant outside to help our engineers to try to move forward, to try to get this coastal stuff wrapped up and start executing uh, repairs. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the other thing is, uh, this will be posted on our website, which you have a handout on, so we don't expect you to be able to read every line item. Again, this is an overview, but the documentation will be on the those charts that you just saw, you'll be able to see those. Okay, let's move on to the actual projects and studies. Um, the reason we're here tonight, actually, is one of the four <coughs> recommendations of the community assessment was, you need to do a better job of communicating what's going on in the town and what are the cultural <coughs> of, uh, processes that are going on, and educate folks and hear from folks so this was actually just from the study in 2008. So tonight, what we're doing is taking that seriously. And we hope this is just one of a series of forums where we can hear from you and hear what your priorities are. The community assessment also recommended three other items, which are all in the works. Um, long range coastal resilience vision, uh, community conversations on managed retreat, 
and updating emergency management. And you're going to be hearing about this as we go on. Um, now we're going to hear from Kyle, who's going to give us a brief overview of actual projects, actual reports, and what they mean to us. I just want to thank you all for coming out, and thank you, Louise, for putting this all together. Um, she's gathered a ton of great information putting this event together, and um, you know we're going to have some website, like she said. But this is—it's um, been very useful for me. I just started a little over six months ago to go through this exercise because now I know everything going on, and um, you know Luis has been really going above and beyond putting this together. So thank you, Luis. Thank you, Carolyn, for putting this together. So. Um, you know, <laughs> so yeah, one of the things that, as Louise mentioned, that we have been hearing repetitively is there's so many studies um, and, and not enough action. So last year, we, we had completed this MVP plan, and that's a building resilience situate. And, um, you know, so we, we are about to do this next uh, downtown harbor master plan. I was inviting people to the downtown harbor master plan and people are like, ah, another study, you know? And um, the, the reason we're doing all these studies is because a lot of these studies unlock more grant opportunities. So, for example, the MVP plan that you guys all partook in, and we're very grateful that you partook in, um, allows us to qualify for CZM, an Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs grant. So without being MVP designated, we would not qualify for all uh, these grants. So uh, these are all the grants that we've received in the last 10 years that are either from CZM or from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And we need to be MVP certified as a community. So thank you guys for partaking in that process. And out of that MVP, um, designation, one of the recommendations was uh, to do a downtown harbor master plan to build resilience in the, in, the, um, in, in the harbor. So that's one of the things we've been doing. I hope I keep going back. Um, so another example of why we need all uh, these plans um, is our hazard mitigation plan. So our hazard mitigation plan is a great process that we complete in this community where all the different town staff, emergency officials get together and plan uh, for all the hazards that potentially could happen within the situation. And we are uniquely, uniquely qualified as a community to be impacted by a lot of hazards. On top of that, by us having a hazard mitigation plan, we qualify for hazard mitigation grants and uh, hazard mit mitigation assistance grants, and we've used those. We've used those to, to elevate, over the last 10 years, 25 homes, and 50 in the last 20 years. I was just out on site with NEMA um, and FEMA last week looking at another one we're gonna elevate, and they said we um, are by far, like double any other community in the state in home elevations. So if you want more information um, on that program, and how to elevate a home. Um, basically, if you are a severe or repetitive loss structure, uh, there's grant funding available to elevate your home. Um, so these are the specific grants um, that we've applied for and received, over $3.7 million in home elevation grants. Um, so because we're MVP certified, we, as I was mentioning, we um, applied to do a downtown harbor sustainability and resiliency master plan, which is currently underway. Um, we received, Brad had applied for a grant, we received 37500 from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. The Economic Development Commission and Situate chipped in 12500 um, Brad and I were sitting down and talking, and we thought that if we had 25000 more, we could substantially benefit um, the plan, increase the meat and potatoes, and include a lot more public participation. So we applied to NAPC for an additional $25,000, um, a technical assistance grant, and we were awarded. So we now have $75,000 to complete this plan that's currently um, going on. And I think Christian uh, from NAPC is in the room. If he wants to come up, you want to come up real quick? And, uh, that process is underway, and Christian's just going to give a, a quick um, 
overview of where they're at in the process. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Christian Brandt. I'm a community engagement coordinator with uh, MAPC, so I'm one of the project members uh, for the Harbor Master Plan. Um, right now we are planning our focus groups. Um, some of you may have been emailed by me um, in the last couple weeks. We're really specifically looking at the moment for residents of Front Street um, and, this, and like the surrounding streets. If you live in the harbor, please find me afterwards. I'd love to Thank you. recruit you to the focus group. Um, but that's kind of where we are right now. We're working on a bunch of research and analysis. Um, we're preparing for the focus groups, and then we'll be starting an engagement, a public engagement process into the fall and the spring, uh, which will help us craft the plan together with all of you. Yeah. yeah, so as everyone pretty much is aware, you know, the, the harbors, you know, the, the heartbeat of the community, and, a lot of the studies are showing that there could be significant change in that area. So, you know, we're, we're working hard to bring the right people to the table, um, come up with decisions to better the future of our harbor and make it more resilient and sustainable. So, also because we are MVP designated, we applied for a manager tree feasibility study um, from MAPC. Uh, in our coastal community assessment, which was done last year, one of the things that the, the residents, so the coastal community assessment, residents, business owners, and civic leaders within town were interviewed to see what they thought the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities are of being a coastal community. One of the recommendations was to hold a forum like this, which we're doing, and another one of the recommendations was to convene conversations about manager treat. So, we had been approached before my time here. Um, the town was approached by residents of Peggy Beach, interested in, interested in exploring options for Peggy Beach. Um, they came to us. You know, what can we do? What are some potential? We know that you know the future is coming quick, and they are open to basically just seeing what those options are. So, one of the um, exercises we're doing is seeing if they can move back and up. Um, there's a town piece of land behind there, seeing if that's feasible. Just basically, you know, the, the $35,000 grant we received, the majority of the funding is being used on interviews with the residents because we want them to kind of lead the conversation um, and, and basically we're, we're kind of trying to gauge, you know, what actually are the residents of Peggy Beach interested in doing so we can start from there. Oh, I'll be back up. All right, hello everybody. Uh, Brad Washburn, Planning and Development. Um, so this project in North Sister at the Miami Beach uh, was actually one of our first coastal resilience grants. Well, I think back in 2015, Kevin, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And this was so that we applied to the state to re uh, receive funding for both design, engineering, and permitting for a beach nourishment project. Um, it was funded in successive phases, and again, we, we got up to the point where we were shovel ready. Um, and actually, I was still working at the state, the state coastal zone management office, worked as kind of the coordinating body to go after federal money. So in 2015, 2000, no, I think it was 2017, um, the Army Corps issued, uh, or ran a grant program essentially countrywide throughout their 10 uh, districts. And basically what it was was a beneficial reuse project where they would basically fund the dredging project and then fund um, the actual placement of that material on the beach as well. So we partnered with the Department of Conservation and Recreation um, down in Nantasca Beach, the towns of, South, uh, towns of Salisbury and Newbury, and we created kind of this regional application. We applied to the core, um, although you know, I think we had a really good shot. We had a great project. You know, every town would, tremendous amount of material. Even if we'd only got a piece of that, it would have been you know, a tremendous benefit to us. You know, unfortunately, our project was not selected. Um, it's not a huge, pro uh, huge surprise. A lot of the uh, funding went to the Mid-Atlantic to deal with some of the post-Hurricane Sandy efforts. So those were the projects that were funded, and we unfortunately didn't get funded. But again, we're keeping our eyes peeled um, you know, for this project as it is shovel ready. We received almost a half a million dollars in funding um, Got to get it to that point. 
Uh, the second project, uh, again, another um, alternative or another priority identified in you know, one of the studies, it was a 2016 analysis done by Applied Coastal, um, was you know, attention needed at Hum Rock. Um, so there was the Hum Rock Roadway Elevation Beach and Dune Nourishment Project. This project essentially called for the elevating uh, central lab and doing a, a mixed sediment dune nourishment project on the beach side. Again, we see flooding and coastal erosion from the ocean side, and we were seeing kind of backside flooding along Central Ave. So this project was intended to address both of those issues. Um, again, this project predated me. Um, there was, we received funding again in successive phases to do design, engineering, and permitting. So we got the project to the point where it was shovel ready. Um, when I came on board, we were still having conversations with residents about potential easements that we needed. Uh, Massachusetts is a little unique that folks can own down to low water, so a lot of the project area is actually owned you know, by private landowners. So in order for the town to do the project, we have to receive easements to you know, be able to access their property and, and maintain this in the future. Um, despite best efforts, I think there was still kind of some unease about this, the easements, and we did not receive enough easements to move forward with the project. Again, we're Ready, we're right up to the point where it's shovel ready. We're keeping our eyes peeled, but for now, um, this project is on hold. That's it. Thank you. And Kevin gets the, uh, the limelight on the biggest success. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming. My name is Kevin Caffey. I'm the DPW director. And um, one of the things we're going to talk about is the Oceanside Drive seawall that is recently in. Um, as John said before, and uh, Chief Murphy said, Beamer is difficult to work with. But one of the things we're able to do is get funding for this through uh, the state. So we received grants as well as some low interest loans from the state, and we were able to do this seawall. Um, a few years back, working with the selectmen, we were able to get $200,000 in our budget for our grant for seawalls and $200,000 for roadways. So we use that money to construct plans, permit, and get that all taken care of ahead of time. When we submit for these grants, we need to have a shovel-ready project. All permits set to go so that we stop the project as soon as they get the grant. We go right out to bid. And there's a timeline. You might have a year to two years to complete this entire project. And they're pretty significant. So we had a lot of major we had a major study in 2015 over coastal erosion that helped build our case. Um, we had begun development of a four-phase rehabilitation area. We classified Oceanside Drive as one of our most troublesome areas. The reason is we had huge flooding in that area. It was, you know, affecting a lot of homes. We were also able to upgrade the drainage when we did it. Um, so, we'll go to the next slide. Oh, there's one more. Yep. So, this is, this is a seawall and this is some of the construction work that goes on. Um, we raise the seawalls up by two feet. So we increase the size of two feet. Everybody says that's easy. A lot of people said to me, why didn't we just raise them up by two feet in the first place? Um, it'd be a lot easier. But the problem is the force of the waves come in and it creates a, a turning effect on the walls. You have to go deeper on them. Also, because we're losing all that sand out in front of them, we have to go significantly deeper. So we go down four to five feet deeper and we also go with a spread footing. So the problem we have is when you go that deep, you might be six to seven feet off of a house. So a lot of support goes in and a lot of effort goes in beforehand to take that out. The other thing you have to do is you have to remove the old seawall. So at that time, we're all nervous and crossing our fingers that we don't get any storms. So I want to talk about um, DPW with my guys also. When these construction projects are going on, we have uh, myself, um, engineering supervisor and two engineers. So we basically work on this job, just takes up a ton of our time. Um, with resident complaints, concerns, oversight of the contractor. We also use um, engineering firms in with us, but to keep the cost down and build these projects for what we have, we put a lot of our staff on this. There's at least one engineer full time on this job, where the job's going on, as well as you know, we have weekly job meetings and everything else. It, it takes a lot of time from everybody. Um, 
The other thing is, even with all the FEMA work, Chief Murphy was talking about all the FEMA work. Basically, in the DPW for the past three years, I've got Dan Smith, who I believe is here. Dan? Raise your hand. Dan, Dan has spent probably the past three years full time working on FEMA, getting FEMA stuff. So that's that's stuff that's not, he could be working on other things for the town, but it's stuff that we need to do in order to get these grants. So, and meet all the requirements to get this FEMA money. So, it's it takes a lot of effort from everybody. So, um, could you want to look at the map? Yep, we skipped one. Yeah. Okay, so these are the phases of work um, that we were working in, some of the different areas, and Basically, what was happening is this whole area was turning into a, into a large bowl and it filled up. We figured, you know, I, I think I think we're about 30 million gallons of water during a major flood. So we raised the seawall. Some areas of the seawall had actually sunk. We raised it up by over three, three to three and a half feet. So as John stated earlier, we also built riprap in front of it so that we tried to limit some of the erosion in the future. Um, and protect the coast. We also upgraded the drainage in there. So over the past, say, a year and a half, we've seen a lot better results from some of the storms. We haven't seen as much water. Um, it's held up better. But with each section, there's a lot of work again because we have to go out and get easements from everybody. Um, we need to have clear easements and have the easements ahead of time when we go to the grants. <coughs> we show the easements to the state and we're ready to go. We're a shovel ready project. As soon as uh, we get the grant, we have to be prepared to bid um, because the timelines are that strong. So um, we did all the phases except there's one green section, I believe, which, which we didn't do because we didn't have the easements. So um, we moved on from that section. So, uh, yeah. so these are future projects in the pipeline. Um, and I hate to summarize the whole town on one slide, but this is this is what we have. Um, FEMA committed to work Sandy, Juno, Nemo, as Chief Murphy was saying, and we're working on Riley. Um, we're doing design and permitting are underway for uh, repairs to those storms. And for anybody, if you're out on Third Cliff and remember some of the past projects we did there about eight years ago, FEMA was very difficult. A lot of people came to us and said, you know, you repaired this section of the wall, but not this section. We can only do, FEMA will actually go out and count the rocks with us and say you can repair these seven rocks, but you can't do these five. <coughs> and, and that's what we're funded for. So when we're out there and we're saying, no, we can't do this, we can only do this section, that's what we're mandated by, by the feds when we're out there. And I know it sounds crazy, but a lot of times it's not funded to do the entire section. One of the things we're working on now with FEMA is to try to do bigger sections where they're not as picky and saying you can't do this rock, you can't do that rock, so that we take whole sections and we're selling them on that as we go. Um, we're working on Turner Road to Cedar Point area. Um, one of the big things we've done in the Cedar Point area over to Turner Road is we've been working with the Army Corps. That started, but the Army Corps, I didn't think anybody could work slower than FEMA, but the Army Corps is catching up. Um, you know, I, I, we can, and I say, just give us the money, and we can do it for half the cost. I, I feel we really can, because there's a huge bureaucracy there, and they go so slow, and I didn't know there were so many things you could look, look for before you start one of these projects. Um, Turner Road, we're looking to put out an RFP. Um, to get that designed and permitted for our future funding so we can go after a grant. Um, and I'll explain how that works. Uh, I already brought up about the funding of our, our budget for $200,000 for um, seawall work. We use that money for Turner Road. So we'll go out and get a design for doing that section of Turner Road. We're probably going to break it up into two projects. And, you know, you're looking at somewhere between seventy-five dollars to $100,000 on design permitting and everything else to get that project built up. Um, let me see, we're also, we've been working with the Corps. They're requiring a ton of information. Um, you know, and back as Brad was talking about the sand work up in North Situate, we actually approached the Corps um, a while ago. I think it was Dave Ball who brought it up to me in 77, 78. Um, 
they brought, the Corps actually brought sand in. They were bringing sand in every year to the North Scituate Beach. <coughs> and we actually found a document that said that they were doing the work and everything else. So we sent them back in and said, we're ready. We need more sand here. Can you come out tomorrow? <laughs> and and they were like, they were in a panic, like, oh, what's, what's going on? So then we started working with them. We were able to get some um, grants through Coastal Zone Management. And then that project took off. Um, unfortunately, we've had trouble getting funding because nobody wants to you know, bite off that project quite yet because it'll turn into a small $3 million to a 10 or $12 million project pretty quickly. Um, the cliffs work, um, damage to all the cliffs have been documented. As I said, um, Dan Smith has been working on that and getting that up. We've got some really uh, impressive drawings that we submitted to FEMA. And um, one of the things that they recently came back to us, we thought we'd be starting work as early as this year, is they came back and asked for an environmental assessment. So that is a very long permit document that can take six months to a long time to get together. So that's something that we're working on for the cliffs. Um, we have a new consultant that we're working with that we're uh, putting on some of that work for an environmental assessment and all that stuff. Um, FEMA has committed the funding. And then we have um, Fourth Cliff, the Army Corps is working now with the Air Force and they're trying to come up with a plan on stabilizing that and that seems to be moving along pretty quick. I wish they'd work uh, as quick on turn a road for us, but um, that's where we are. And we have, next one. So the next thing we're going to talk about is um, Egypt, Man Hill, Cobble Beach. So that's been damaged significantly. Does anybody in the room live in that area or know that area? Okay, so you saw back two years ago, we had that storm and we got over top. So we were able to put in for funds because that's a designed beach. And that has actually been moving back and forth. The unfortunate thing is um, a few years, maybe 15 years ago, the town went out and tried to actually dig out of the pond and bring the material back and reconstruct it and got in a lot of trouble with um, the DEP Conservation Army Corps because you cannot just pull the material back. That's the natural course of action. You can only add to the material and reshape it. So we're in the project, or we're in the process of putting this project together that we're hoping will be going up to bid soon, where we're actually going to reshape the berm, build the berm up, build it higher, wider, and um, add a lot more protection to that area. So that's that's coming out soon. Um, and, and that's pretty much it for, for where we are and what's going on. Thank you. So we go over two uh, grant opportunities that we have in the works, just real quick, because we have 15 minutes to go over a lot more stuff. But um, we applied for, this is actually, again, because we're MVP certified, we applied for another grant in uh, collaboration with Cohasset for $150,000 to do a storm um, side pathway analysis. And everyone knows FEMA flood maps. But basically what storm tide pathways is, is they go to different, the, the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown will go to different sections of our, our coast and they take benchmark data um, through like survey work. And at the end of it, it they provide real time data for how flood will enter your community, um, flood waters will enter your community. So basically, it, you know, I've heard the feedback, like we know how floods enter our community, like you guys do, you're familiar with that. Um, but if we're projected a certain, certain amount of storm surge, we'll be able to say to the, the fire chief, this is exactly where you guys should be sending your resources. These are the roads that will be shut down um, based off of the data we have. And so in uh, Truro and Provincetown and Nantucket, they've um, received very successful data. Um, we were actually out, uh, was, we were in Provincetown. And, um, they, based off the data they received, they were able to put sandbags in one specific location because it was a low hanging area and that prevented the whole downtown from being flooded. So uh, I can't guarantee that we'll get results like that, but what we will be able to see is exactly how flood water moves. You know, sometimes it could be coming back through the marsh and then overtopping. So we're excited to get that data and we hope that, we're, we're very hopeful that it's gonna help our emergency response. Um, so, we touched on Humrock quickly. Um, Brad and I 
just applied for uh, a grant from CZM, um, a $250,000 grant, uh, to, to come up with a 50-year coastal vision, um, which will be community-led to the town of Situate. So basically, uh, what we applied for is to have the consensus building an institute go to each section of the coast and meet with the residents of that area and basically talk through the, the hard-hitting questions and try to come through, uh, come come up with some consensus. There'll be a lawyer on the team, there'll be an engineer, but it's basically, you know, sit down, like we'll show our cards, this, this is what we have proposed, how do you guys feel about it? The town's actually gonna take a back seat in that process and have the consensus building institute really just meet with the residents and try to figure out where they're at um, in regards to a lot of these things that are difficult to talk about. Um, and there'll be a lawyer there more for the residents to ask questions and you know kind of figure out what is legal what's not legal um, but i have more information on both of those two grants if anybody has any questions over to you. Thanks. Um, and later on all of those new programs are on that um, blue board over there um, the final thing that we're going to talk about is emergency management because obviously you have to be really on top of that in any coastal Thank you. So we talked a little bit about FEMA, what emergency management does with FEMA. And emergency management in the town is, uh, you have a lot from, by a police, from the town administrator, town hall, town hall employees, you have uh, schools that support our shelters. So there's a multitude of people that make emergency management su successful in situ. And we try to learn to manage them. Sorry? With it, I can say DPW, fire, police, stuff. And DPW, I saw Dan Smith back here. Dan is doing an outstanding job on the coastal stuff. He's been, like Kevin said, he's almost a full-time job just doing that, that work. And he's really good at it. He's worked well, and um, he's leading the way in the coastline for us. So he deserves a lot of credit for that. So as far as emergency men, there's a lot of people involved. A lot of people to make, make it successful. And what we try to do after each one, we try to learn from what happens in this store. How can we do it better? How can we make our town more resilient aside from our force shore protection? So what we've, uh, what we've learned, I'll give you one example. In 2015, uh, shortly after that, I went to a, uh, a seminar on hurricanes. And they were saying that 20 to 25% of our trees will come down if we get a strong cat to cat three hurricane here. We lost probably about two or three percent of our trees in the mine storm, and that was a challenge in 18. So that, looking at that, I'm trying, as far as the fire chief, we provide EMS, how do we provide EMS, a, a, sort of like a triage or a mass unit, because we're not getting to the hospital for three or four days. If we get a cat two, three hurricane, it's not just situated, it's everybody. And the resources are gonna be spread wide across the state. So how can we, so we have to look at, how do we get MOUs with the hospital? We've been talking about this with MEMA, in South Shore Hospital for about three years now. They're finally listening. They're finally saying, you know what, you're right, we have to come up with a plan, we have to come up with MOUs, we have to have agreements that, you know, we're gonna need extra medications. The three primary things that happen, injuries happen, it's usually chest pain, heart attacks, diabetic reactions, and then with tetanus shots, everybody that gets cuts, and trying to you know, move limbs, and, and also electrical issues when you have wires down. So we're looking to have a plan now. We actually have a Mass Maritime intern working with eight towns that have volunteered to participate in this. And we're trying to come up with a plan and, and work with the hospitals, both Jordan, BI, BI Plymouth, uh, Beth Israel Plymouth, and, and South Shore Hospital. We need an MOU now to say, listen, when we get a storm coming, you're going to give us X amount of medications per town. You're going to have a liaison to help us. We're trying to work with our CERT teams. We want to try to get more retired, retired nurses and, and and people in the medical field to join us because we need help. If we did a hurricane, we're looking to expand our shelter capabilities to the junior high. We did a walk through the junior high, so we have expansion potential. We have a plan B, we have a plan C. If we ever get a cat four or five, we're open up every school we need to. But so this is the, the, the stuff we have to think sort of big picture. We do nor'easters very well, but if we get a cat two or three hurricane, it's going to be a whole other game. So we all got to prepare for that. Um, yeah, that's it. So what we've done so far, uh, aside from that, you know, our, our, our utility and MEMA, we have a great relationship with all utilities. We always have a liaison in our emergency operations center for every storm, uh, from National Grid, Columbia Gas, Eversource for Hammer Rock, and MEMA's there. So we are, I have all my cell phone. If we need something, usually I'm the first one to call. I get two days ahead. I want to be first on the list for, 
for evacuation vehicles, for extra resources. So, uh, and they have a great spot. They, you know, we, we see them with all these trains and stuff like that too. Say hello. We have great, great relationships with them, and that means a lot when you when you're trying to get these resources for get them first. We've also taken a lot of our uh, power shutoffs along Oceanside Drive. We had problems with that in 15. We moved them all up to the side streets as far away as we can get it out of the flood zone, but minimizing the impact. So we only went up like two or three, four homes. So if we have to shut the power up, it's less of an impact. We can maybe isolate it into zones. So we learned from the 2015 stuff. How can we do this better? So we went with National Grid, their engineers, they came up. We also met with Eversource down in Hummel Rock. North Hummel Rock, North Central Lab, gets beaten out, the worst in town. So what can we do there? Because if one primary comes down in Hummel Rock, the whole peninsula loses power. Loses power. If it's North Hummel Rock, it could be for days. So what we did, we met with Eversource and that's some engineers. They have a power shut off on Bayberry Road on the Julian Street Bridge on the Montfield side. Shuts the whole peninsula down from their desk. Press the button, it's done. So when we met, we met with them and asked them, listen, we don't usually have problems with most of Humber Rock. It's North Central Lab, we have a problem. Can you put that same shutoff in Central Lab? We put it, so in a long story short, it was a $75,000 project. They funded it. They put it at 220 Central Lab. So if we have to shut the power off to North Situate, I mean North Humber Rock, we can do that without affecting 80% of the peninsula. So we're in the utility companies. We've been doing things on how can we improve on these, um, on these um, pass tools. Gas flow limiters, there was about a dozen people that didn't have flow limiter shutoffs. So if you, should, if you, were, if you lived on the ocean and the storm took off your gas meter, if you didn't have one of these, it would be free flowing. So very dangerous situation, cause a fire, whatever it is. So an access for us getting there would be very difficult. So what they did, they found out, I think David Ball was instrumental in this, asking the question, and there were some homes that we, they, they had missed. So they went out, installed those. So every home along the ocean has flow limiters. And there's also, I think, after 68, anybody that had one put in has a flow limiter no matter where you live. So those are very important. Columbia Gas uh, worked well with us on that. Uh, continuous improvements, I'm going to go through. We talked about the protocol. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so. Sandbags, Kevin talked about sandbags earlier. In 2018, uh, we got a lot of flag in, in January, and that storm didn't get um, obligated as a storm, but we had a lot of flooding, especially downtown. It was the highest tide on record. So looking at that storm, how can we learn? You know, we, um, the next storm came in March, and we need sandbags, especially for our downtown business. They got a lot of them got flooding. How can we make this better? So we got sandbags from MEMA. We got piles of sand from DPW, and we shoveled. And it was a lot of sore backs, but everybody got it done. Citizens, town workers, everybody volunteered. So what we did is a collaboration between departments, fire, police, DPW, and facilities. We got an EMPG grant, and we all pitched in the balance to get this uh, skid tractor. It's the front mount. Kevin has a tractor for it. We can make 640 sandbags an hour with no backs getting hurt. No injury. So, <coughs> so we can, we're going to have this uh, probably maybe a St. Mary's again, depending on when the storm is, where it is. We now have the capability through a grant and, and, and different uh, pops working together. Okay, so this is a great tool for us. Next slide. This is a dewatering pump. If you remember in 2015, 11th, 10th and 11th Ave, the pool of water there, since DPW was fixed and, uh, and, and made that drainage much better, but they had two or three feet of water, it was freezing. And they couldn't get to the homes, the top was starting to freeze. So we put in for a grant to the Department of Fire Services from Patrick O'Connor. They got us this pump. It's 1,600 gallons a minute. It's a six inch intake. This is just for neighborhoods, not for homes. This will take your dog and cat in two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is a the problem. We got, we got this grant here through uh, $40,000 paid for by the Department of Fire Services. We also got $100,000 towards the, uh, the Hub Rock Fire Station, which we're looking to, to replace uh, phase one, hopefully this fall, and phase two in the spring. So Hub Rock will have a, a more resilient fire station. Both storm, we have water hit the floorboards. Mm -hmm. So we need to improve on that. Again, how can we improve from that storm to the next? And that's what we're trying to do. On our emergency uh, management web page, you go to our town page, go to emergency preparedness. If you go to the next, next slide, we have um, code red. If you're not signed up for first time, one code red, click on that. Give me your information, critical information. You'll be in the middle of the night, you're a seawall breach, you're gonna know about it, but if you don't know, it's code red. It's very important you do so. And let your neighbors know as well. And this will give a whole, all the information on the emergency management team, 
if you look down to uh, this one here, just a hard to compare this volume of vacuum, if we put this app in, in uh, before the January storm of 18, we're having problems with people evacuating. We have to evacuate. You have to move out. You prepare your house the best you can, but Mother Nature is going to do what it's going to do. We want to make sure nobody's lives are at stake, and we don't have to take extra risk as, as rescuers uh, for this. So that I have evacuated, you click on that link, you put your name, your address, your phone number, and the option is where you're going. So if a family member calls in, what we found out is family members are calling in. Can you check in my family? They're in a bad zone. And we were duplicating our efforts and going to very dangerous areas for this. So now we had, in January, we put this app out, this link out. I think about 25 people used it. In March, we had 230. So a very good success. So we know that, listen, if they call up, say, can you check in my family? You know what? They're not, they're, they left their home, they're staying in the best western in Rockland, or if we have a bit of fire and it's going to be multiple homes, we can say, listen, these three homes are evacuated, so we know how to plan our risk management you know, for a fire or a flood uh, rescue. So these are things that we have to be constantly updating the risk management webpage and try to make the information all there for you. So, I mean, if you go on that page, it's a ton of information. A lot of the information we get from, from the town, but also from NEMA and FEMA. Okay, so this is the last one here. I went to an uh, all-hazards um, conference about a month ago. And, you know, um, these are all the things that people say why they're not evacuating. You know, I'm um, safe, I've been doing this, I've been here for 30 years, it's never happened. And how many times do you see that on the Weather Channel? You know, when people say that, and they're like, their home is gone. So, the one thing that really hit me was more people get killed in cars by flooding than anything else. What happens, they leave too late. And you've got to realize it's not just the ocean. If we get these heavy, heavy rains like you saw down in the Carolinas, there's pooled water, you get in flood, it doesn't take much water to take a car away, but almost half the people that drown were drowned in cars. So that's the key for early evacuation. You think, you know what, it's not that bad out here, but you're going down the street and all of a sudden it's, there's four feet of water on the road. I gotta get through, and you don't. So it's early evacuation, early planning is critical for you and the safety of your family. So, um, and kind of that's the advance of number one, um, your diabetes. So we're looking for five ways that we can create, if we get a big storm, we can't get you to the hospital. We're gonna treat you with our paramedics at our, at our uh, triage center in our shelter. So that's what we're trying to plan for now. And that's the latest, what we're trying to work on. And hopefully by, by September, we'll have all the protocols, we'll have the MOU signed, and be able to work with South Shore Hospital and the sounds around us to make it safer for you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so this is a summary of all the new programs that you just heard about. Again, it might be hard to read from where you're sitting. Um, this, in addition to some of the programs that Kevin mentioned, um, we are going to be posting this on our website so you can read it more thoroughly. They're also outlined on that blue chart over there. But we're really excited to see all this activity that's new. You heard about the old, the present, and these are the new uh, programs that we're doing. Um, I'm excited that we're on time for our Q&A. Um, our website is on your handout as well as on this handout. Um, we will be posting this on that. Um, we will also post our next meeting dates, and we have um, decided to follow suit with other town meetings where the first part of the meeting will be open forum. If you want to come and tell us what your issues are that you would like to see addressed by the town.